Welcome, everybody, to this latest edition of Testable Faith. My name is Fuzz Rana. I'm a biochemist and a Christian apologist, and I work for the organization called Reasons to Believe. If you want to know more about Reasons to Believe, go to our website, www.reasons.org. And today we're going to take on the question, just how complex are living systems? And I'm joined in studio by Dr. Eric Hedin to help answer that question. Uh, Eric uh, is a former professor of physics at Ball State University and also at Biola University. And he's also the author of a book called Cancelled Science. Uh, Eric, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, Fuzz. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah. Okay. So um, just how complex are living systems? <laughs> you know, uh, you've written ab about the idea that information theory could actually give us some insight into, into the complexity of life and ultimately into the question of life's origins. Yes. Yeah, so my background is as a physicist, uh, not a, a biochemist or molecular biologist, uh, but um, I feel like physics has some relevance to the mm -hmm. question because uh, any sort of a even biological system uh, is going to be based upon the chemistry of the molecules that make up the cells and and those follow the laws of physics. And so ultimately, um, mm -hmm. there is some foundational connection. And information theory really is in this connection a way to, again, try to determine whether or not the laws of nature are um, a possible source for the origin of, of living systems. And so back to the original question, how complex are living systems? And uh, the answer is they're unlike anything else that's been found in the universe mm -hmm. anywhere. And, and some might say, well, you know, even, you know, rock formations uh, in the mountains are, are very complex. And, uh, mm -hmm. well, they certainly are. Uh, no argument there. But what is different about living systems and their complexity? And the answer is living systems are complex in a specific way that corresponds to uh, predetermined and required um, arrangements of molecules in order to have a functional outcome, namely to be alive. And uh, just any old random complex system will not result mm -hmm. in life. And there has to be very specific ways in which the molecules are arranged, ultimately the atoms are arranged, mm -hmm. in order to allow a system to be alive. And that's so different from any other sort of natural complexity, like the molecules in a cloud or the atoms that make up the rocks on a hillside. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I find fascinating, and hopefully this isn't de derailing the conversation here, and that is, you know, scientists, life scientists can't define what life is. Hmm. You know, and, and that was what actually attracted me to biochemistry oh, as, an right? as an undergraduate was sitting in my first biology class as a pre-med student. And the discussion was, well, nobody knows how to define life. And I just found that to be utterly fascinating, and it completely changed the trajectory of my my studies and my career. Wow! You know, yeah. um, so did you want to go into kind of biochemistry yeah. to try to help answer that question? Exactly, exactly. Wow. But you know, but the point is, is that is that we all recognize when something is alive versus mm -hmm. it's not, but yet we can't define it. And I think that is going to your point, right? That there's something special about life that we all recognize right away. Certainly. I mean, uh, rocks don't qualify as alive. You know, they, right. they don't r reproduce or metabolize. Uh, um, we had a discussion about this in one of the courses I used to teach at Ball State uh, called the Boundaries of Science. You know, what is life or what determines something being alive? And it turned out that some of my students suggested that that fire actually mm -hmm. kind of uh, has a lot of the characteristics of, huh. of life. It, it can, you know, consume materials, it, it has waste products, mm -hmm. uh, it can kind of change with the environment and... Uh, it reproduces yeah. or, or grows, at least. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, it's not based on any sort of a complex operating system. And uh, again, I think that I want to take it back to that, that uh, this is a common ground characteristic of everything that uh, 
is alive. That down at the biochemical level uh, of the cell and within the cell, there is a specified complexity. Um, it's like a metropolis, I've heard a cell yeah. described as. And um, of course, within the cell, we've got the DNA. It's a vast amount of information. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a coding system, um, yeah. an instruction toolbox for creating what the cells need. And um, so how does information theory really uh, tie into that? And uh, so just real briefly, in information theory allows us to in some way quantify the information content of a system, such mm -hmm. as uh, a biochemically relevant molecule like a protein. Right. And um, it has to do with choices. Uh, it has to be put together in a correct process by selecting the proper uh, components, amino acids, in the correct order and so on. And so each of those choices represents a decision point that adds information to the system. Mm. And uh, by studying the information content then of even a, a moderate sized protein molecule, theorists have determined that there's more information in a single protein molecule than in an entire star, mm -hmm. or even in an entire galaxy of stars for that matter. And some would say, well, how could that be? You know, tiny little uh, molecule versus a vast uh, galaxy of stars, you know, surely there's more information. But if, if you're discounting anything living out there in the galaxy, just the natural realm, one way to see that it's not really very information rich is to do a little thought experiment. And I used to uh, talk to my students about this as well. Say, imagine taking a big spoon and, and sticking it into a star and stirring it up. Okay, you've mixed up all the ingredients inside the star and you pull it out. What's gonna happen? Well, in a little while, it'll settle back down and become a star again. You may have temporarily um, disrupted its thermonuclear processes in its core, but gravity and the laws of physics will bring it back to that state where it will shine again. Now do the same thing to a living system and uh, perhaps a, a single cell. Imagine taking a little needle, poking it into a cell and just stirring it up, breaking up all the molecular bonds and, and then pull out the needle and wait. Will it ever just settle back down and become a functioning cell again? And the answer is not not in the history of the universe, it will never do that. So that tells you there's a huge amount of information there that's mm -hmm. specific and it's not just random and it's not just ordered in some sequence. Uh, the only known source for that kind of information is an intelligent mind actually. Well, that's something that I, as a biochemist find utterly fascinating is the fact that at the end, at its essence, biochemical systems are indeed information systems. Yes. And it's very sophisticated information too. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's eerie to me how similar the information structure, you know, in biochemical systems is to the types of information that we create. Uh, there's a, a famous book um, on information theory and the origin of life uh, written by the Bernard Olaf Kuiper, I think, mm -hmm. and he makes the point that when you look at the hierarchical structure of human language, it's identical to the hierarchical structure you see mm -hmm. in biochemical language. You know, wow. you hear biochemists talking about biochemical grammar mm -hmm. and, and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's not just merely information, but it's eerie that it's structured in the way that we would structure information. A correlation between the biochemical uh, kind of uh, structure and, and, and human yeah. thinking and language, and again, both being tied back to intelligence. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so what are the implications of this idea then that if, you know, you've got this enormous amount of information content, even in a single protein, mm -hmm. and the only source of information that we know of is a, is a mind, what does that then mean when it comes to the origin of life, because the origin of life is in effect uh, the origin of these information-rich systems, right? Right, and uh, so I think that the the implication really is that something other than natural processes must have been at work uh, for the origin of life. We know that if you just look at the history of the universe, there. 
Uh, certainly was a time early in the history of the universe when conditions were just impossible for any life to exist. And uh, then at some point life began to exist. And in my mind, that represents a miracle because to suddenly go from no life to life, even if it was a single celled life, is something that is beyond the resources, the natural resources of the universe. And, you know, at, at this point, I would, I would like to actually challenge any um, naturalistic viewpoint that says, oh, well, we just don't know how it could have happened. It, it certainly did happen naturally because it must have. Well, rather than just holding to that conviction, mm -hmm. why not actually analyze it in terms of the laws of physics and try to show a pathway for how nature could do it. And I think that uh, you'll find that it's gonna be a, a long, a futile search. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's people that work as origin of life researchers in their honest moments will tell us that we really have no explanation for the origin of life. And what they mean is there's no explanation that relies on materialistic processes that can account for the origin of life. Yes, and um, you know, again, kind of taking it into the context of the search for extraterrestrial life, if we're listening with radio telescopes for possible signals from space, maybe from some other civilization on another planet, and hoping to find you know, evidence of ET out there, um, I think that if we just sort of refocused those telescopes into the microscopic world, we would see that there is a signal yeah. that uh, if, it, uh, if the telemetry uh, came to us from space that coded for DNA, we would go, that's an intelligent mind behind that. There is no way that could happen naturally. And yet we see it all the time under the microscope when we look at a cell. And so I think that the message is being broadcast loud and clear. And uh, it's only kind of a, a predisposition to dismiss that as an intelligent source, as a evidence for God that could, I guess, cause anyone to say that the, there is no evidence. Well, powerful point, Eric. Thank you so much for you're, being with you're us. You're sure welcome. Uh, uh, thank you for watching this episode of Testable Faith. Uh, if you want to know more about Eric Hedin and, and experience more of the resources that he's produced for us here at Reasons to Believe, go to our website and search his name. Uh, Hedin, H-E-D-I-N is the last name. And also make sure you check out his book, Cancelled Science. Until next time, remember, the more that we know about science, the more that we have reasons to believe.